before 10 a.m., we've already done, I don't know, $20,000 in sales. Wow. We open at 7 a.m. So in the first right. three hours of any of our major sales, like all these posters behind us, each one's for a different sales. So we have like a Friday the 13th, the National Marshmallow Day, that sort of thing. And we just really hit the, um, hit the grassroots marketing aspects of it, you know? Right. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top dispensary owners and experts in this space so that you can stay up to date with the latest trends and strategies that you'd otherwise miss out on. I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, Monster House, welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Thanks for hopping on the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, why don't you just quickly introduce yourselves, tell us your names, where you're located, um, and your store. My name is Gator, We're located at 1275 West Picacho in mm -hmm. Las Cruces, New Mexico. We have other stores in Rio Doso also. Awesome. My name is Maggie, and uh, yeah, we're, lo we're located in Las Cruces, New Mexico, Rio Doso, New Mexico. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us how you got started in the space. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, we are longtime cannabis enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. um, and when New Mexico went recreational back in 2020, we, mm -hmm. we saw how the market was as a consumer and we said, this doesn't work for us. Let's change it. Let's do what we can to make the market better for consumers like us. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of the idea that led us to where we are. So what were some of those things that uh, you thought that you guys could do better when you first got into the market that you thought you can change? When we got into this market, I was just got done reti retired from Department of Defense. And so I was living off of minimum income because I was a retiree. Mm -hmm. And so when the market opened, um, Prices were so high. I always say it cost eighty dollars for an eighth. My wife says I lie about it, but it was really expensive. But on that right. day, we decided to drive to Colorado um, and go pick up weed there because I knew I could get eighty dollar ounces, hundred dollar ounces all day long. Mm -hmm. And since I was a medical patient and a, a rec patient, I wanted to more bang for my buck. Mm -hmm. And so when we went over there, we we were smoking in Trinidad on top of the mountain. <laughs> and we looked at each other nice. and um we're all let's just do this the worst thing that happens is we get i don't know we set it up and we're done in a year um yeah i just wanted to make sure that we got prices so i was able to smoke every day it was <laughs> self, it was really self-serving um but that's what got us into the market was just we hated the prices and we wanted the prices to be the same price as the market has already shown us with California, Colorado, and we just wanted a reciprocal market here. Right, right. So before getting into this space, so you so you mentioned you started in 2020, so up and around the middle of COVID-ish, um, by by the sounds of it. How oh, did I, spoke. I apologize? It was 2022. <laughs> I oh, apologize. 2022. Okay, we were, okay. That's when New no Mexico worries. legalized. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. That's fine. Um, okay, so 2022 is when you started. So, so pre 2022, uh, what was life looking like for you guys before starting? Um, you know, starting up the dispensary. I was working for Department of Defense at the mm -hmm. time, and during COVID, I was actually in charge of uh, um, the vaccine release uh, through Fort Bliss area, mm -hmm. and there was a also a huge migrant crisis coming um, through. Uh, El Paso, Texas at the time. Mm -hmm. So we were in charge of setting up contracts to help mitigate uh, whatever was going on. And so I would set them up. It just was not the job that I wanted to do anymore. Sure. So after 20 some odd years, I couldn't retire because I, I didn't have the age, but I had the time. Mm. So I just decided to quit the government because it was not what I, I saw it, what it used to be as. Right. And so I wanted to go live a humble life in retiree and that's what we decided to do was sell our house and go live in my wife's house over in Las Cruces. Nice. And I just wanted to be a retiree and then the market hit. And of course I didn't like the, the way prices were. So we ended up here. You, you took it into your own hands. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. And Maggie, what about yourself? Um, you know, I, am I call myself a Crucis native. I've been here for 30 years of, of my life. Um, you know, I went to middle school, high school here, college here. Um, I was, I've done pretty much everything in the service industry. I've done hospitality, mm -hmm. in-home healthcare. I've done insurance, bank teller, all that stuff. So I've got a pretty well-rounded 
background in service. Um, so that's kind of where we lie. You know, I'm mm -hmm. the operations and he's the marketing genius um, behind all of our stuff. And that that's the bulk of it. You know, we, we said, let's go ahead, retire. Let's buy an RV. We'll travel, you know, live that dream. And then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, here we are now working 15 hour days, seven days a week, you know, but yeah, the dream belongs to us. So it makes it worth it at the end of the day. Right, right. And Monster House, tell me, tell me about how that, how that started. How did, how did this uh, creation come about? So we, we have a couple of different stories for this, but me and sure. my wife, um, <laughs> I fell in love with my wife under, under this song called, from Mut Mutford and Sons called mm -hmm. Mon it's Monster by Mumford and Sons. And nice. um, that name, Monster, always stuck with me. And there's a line in it, as I'll turn into a monster for you. Mm -hmm. And we both got that tattooed it on ourselves. And when we decided dispensary, I was all, what's the coolest thing I could come up with? And I've been in love with the uh, <sighs> scary movie since I was a child. Mm -hmm, One of my mm -hmm. favorite movies was a Disney classic called Monster Squad. And so it just fit that we came up with Monster House. Horror movies. <laughs> you know, that's, and that's a lot of it, too. It's it's classic. There's an it's a niche part of the market that right. also nobody else has grabbed. You see, um, I would like to say the Tim Burton enthusiasts out there yep. in the world. And they they love that little creepy vibe and that sort of thing. And people will full on decorate their whole homes in that in that decor. So, yeah, that's that's what we decided to go with. No, I think that's awesome because all the way from the name to the reason why you started the dispensary as a whole, it was very much self-serving in a way, but not in a selfish type of way, right? It's like, okay, I'm starting this because I see a problem in the market and I'm essentially solving the problem for myself. I'm starting this dispensary. I'm naming it Monster House because it's something that, that means a lot to us, you know, as business partners, as husband and wife, and you're able to kind of go through a lot of the hardships and the challenges that, you know, you know business just has inherently. Um, I've mentioned this a few times before, but if you want to, you know, do difficult things, uh, become an entrepreneur. If you want to do even more difficult things, become a cannabis related entrepreneur, um, because there's some things in this industry that a lot of other people don't, you know, have, uh, you know, any relation to, right? You see other people online talking about business and marketing, where you're like, well, I can't even do half of those things because due to compliance and regulation is just super tricky. So the traditional routes where the blueprints really laid out to say, let's say you started a restaurant, um, another industry that I think is hyper competitive, but at least the blueprint is relatively laid out in the things that you can do, right? When you start Ooh. a dispensary, there's not really anyone or any particular entity that you can look at, because even from different states, there's different things that you can do. So it's very, very tricky. And I really think that if you're able to tie your business into solving your own problems to where, hey, if I can get this thing done and I like it in the day to day, those 15 hour days, while, you know, not every day is, you know, uh, uh, sunshine and rainbows, it, you're able to kind of go through some of those hard times because then when the better times come in, you know, it's all it's all bonus. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We agree. And I mean, going back to the the blueprint of it all, I will say that there's a couple of things New Mexico has done right with mm -hmm. regards to their recreational <laughs> Um, laws and restrictions, you know, they, they permit us to market, which is awesome. We can advertise so long as 75% of the traffic or more is over the age of 21. So that opens mm. up a world of bars, <laughs> you know, some yeah. restaurants we can advertise on billboards. So at least we are not hobbled by that, right. by that aspect, the way that Colorado is, you know, we're not having to yeah. adopt highway roadside cleanups just to get our name out there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what are your current uh, biggest challenges so far? Staffing. <laughs> Staffing and personnel management. You know, we can get into a whole generational bashing thing, right? We're sure. middle-aged. We're like, it wasn't like this when I was younger. When, we when I, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right? But no, at the end of the day, right. it comes down to the kind of relationships you want to cultivate with your staff, the right. um, attracting staff that is of the same mindset that we're all kind of here to serve a purpose. And that as long as we're all doing what we're supposed to do, we can all eat dinner tonight. Um, right. And getting, getting to the core of that, that interpersonal relationship, I would say that's mm -hmm. probably one of our bigger challenges um, and taxes. We could talk here for the next 15 oh. hours about taxes. No problem. 
<laughs> oh man, uh, it seems whenever I ask this question, taxes is always the thing that everyone has issues with. And it's because largely in part, you can't necessarily do anything about it, right? At least with staffing, you can, you know, uh, go through a certain amount of people, you can try and internally fix your processes, you know, how can I become a better leader? Um, how do I incentivize the bad tenders and higher level staff to work a little bit better? And obviously not everything works, right? But when it comes to taxes, it's like, well, what can you really do about it, right? <laughs> You can write mm -hmm. that check is what you can do. That's about exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. On the, so on the staffing end, what are you, uh, you know, what are you trying to do right now to, to kind of help out yourself with that issue? <gasps> trainings. We're implementing trainings. a lot of trainings. Um, I'm a big believer that if people understand the why behind right. the rule, then it makes right. it easier for them to help enforce those rules. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very transparent with staff about, we do A, B, and C because of X, Y, and Z. Right. And uh, that seems to help, you know, and just like with all things, you just have to keep going, keep doing it. Yes, mm -hmm. we did a training three months ago. We're going to retrain in another three months because right. attrition is a thing. And sure. it, especially in the dispensary world, everyone thinks, oh, I'm going to come in and I'm just going to sling weed all day. And this is going to be the funnest job ever. And yep. at the end of the day, it's still a job and there's yep. still requirements. And, um, you know, we have to, compliance is, the current that keeps everything going. And right. that's part of it too, is just training people on how to be compliant and, and uh, keep the ship afloat. Right, right. And, and are you the one personally running the trainings every, every month, every week, you know, every quarter kind of thing? We both do. Uh, I mean, it, it really all depends on what the training's about, because we both sure have different strengths when it comes to our experiences. Mm -hmm. We also have a great operations manager that helps us with stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And then on the flip side, um, what's been working really well for you guys? In the dispensary world? <laughs> like in, in your in your world as well, a whole, staffing. mostly related to cannabis. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, like, uh, did you mean like staffing or? It could be anything, well? you know, um, you know, we chat about things all the way from vertical integration to product launches to, um, you know, maybe you have a killer accountant, right? <laughs> that can, you know, find some really good things working well for you, right? Now you're um, going to make me call out my accountants. <laughs> Because if I don't, he's going to mess up my books. No, no, I'm sure he's doing a fantastic job. But yeah, uh, farming, uh, working great with vendors, having good relationship partners with the bars um, in terms of community aspect. You know, anything that's kind of, you're like, yes, this is something I can finally be like, this is, you know, I'm happy about this. So one thing I strive from the beginning, I came from a world of contracting for the government. Mm -hmm. So I had to negotiate with everyone. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I, I strive with for when we first started was I had to find an interpersonal relationship and partner up with, people, with, with certain people. Because mm -hmm. if I wanted prices to be where I'm at, I had to find someone willing. Mm -hmm. And so someone willing to have the same mindset as me. So that was the first thing I did. And I was able to lock down a couple of guys right away that had the exact same mindset as me. And so I was able to give lower prices right away because... I had partnerships where no one else did. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I value the, the negotiations I had with vendors mo the most. So, so like all the work that we put in right. in the beginning is now paying off while everybody else is trying to do the catch up. Right. And right. so vendor relationships is the most important thing to me. Um, and when we have, when we connect value with two vendors, then we could, could connect partnerships and it just helps move the ball f further and longer. Right, right, right. So super high level, what are your kind of main keys to developing good vendor relationships? So in the beginning, I used to talk to everyone. Everyone mm -hmm. who walked in the door and the first thing I noticed was all vendors want to talk shit. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, they walk in the store, they, oh, I have better product than this guy. My shit's better uh, than this person. Mm, and mm. we have customers in the store, right? Like right. nobody wants to hear that. And yeah, you might, but more likely you don't. Um, we, all, we all sell weed. And so like at the end of the day, it's just the different way we package it. Some right. people might have higher percentages. Some people might have prettier stuff, but it's what the end client wants at the end. So mm -hmm. now I give people a little slip and they have to email me. Mm. And so once they email me, I send them a message back and 
that's when my negotiation starts. Mm -hmm. I, I tell them they have to buy me a blunt to come talk to me because <laughs> my time is valuable. I right. can't speak to everybody, but if you get a contract with me and you, you start doing business with me, your first order is $30,000. Exactly. And it costs you $50 to buy me a blunt to send right. talk man to man. And I want to, it's not doing business with the company. It's doing business with the person. Mm -hmm. The person mm -hmm. is the one I'm doing business with. Right. If I could trust that person, I could trust the company. But right. I just don't want to buy off a menu. I'm not an end customer. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm the wholesaler. I'm the plug. I need to know you. I right. want the interpersonal relationships. I want to call you when I have a flat tire and you come pick up my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, there's true story that's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's how, Albert, that's how you build good relationships. Ortiz, he's he's a BKFC <laughs> fighter. Um, <laughs> but he went and picked up my daughter when I just called right. him in the middle of nowhere. I couldn't make it. I was three hours away. And that's awesome. not too many people out there will do that for you. Right. And those are the type of people that I value my relationships with. Right, right. So I'm a vendor. I'm able to uh, get to the email inbox of Gator. What are the things that I need to do as a vendor to get your business? The first thing is, okay, the, the, there's two different type of people. Mm -hmm. One person automatically tells me I'm too busy to come see you. I'm mm -hmm. too busy to do this. Mm -hmm. I just look at my menu. Automatically, mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk to you. Right. Guess what? Right. I'm too busy too, bro. Like I, I'm driving. I have four stores. I have, I mean, over 60 employees. I'm busy. Mm -hmm. um, so my time is valuable. So if you tell me that you want to come down on a Tuesday and meet me at my store and buy me a blunt, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to give you 30 minutes of my time and we're going to sit down and figure out if we can work together or not. Right. Another big key factor is uh, you got to smoke. You got to mm. be a smoker to know the business. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're a businessman. Right. And that is something that we've seen too. We've had vendors show up and, oh, full disclosure, I don't consume marijuana. And I'm like... <clears throat> What are, what would you say you do here, Bob? Like what's yeah. going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you just here to just, you know, kind of push emails and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I don't think it's at this point yet because I still think in comparison to, let's say, you know, like the wine industry as a whole, very, very young, right? We're babies compared to that, right? But you have your sommeliers, right? And then you have your craft breweries. And I, and I think, I would hope that this kind of goes into more so that direction in a world where I want the highest THC thing at the lowest cost, right? And I get it, right? Um, yeah. If you do want your alcohol for the students that, hey, I just need to get a buzz. Obviously, there will always be a market for, you know, kind of lower products as well. Um, but being able to kind of really differentiate uh, different product values instead of it just being, hey, just smoke this thing and then you can get this high off it or consume this edible and then, you know, so on and so forth. It'd be very interesting to see over the next couple of years, you know, how this industry uh, kind of builds out. And especially with the products that are coming out, I, I think I spoke to somebody and they had these, I don't, I forgot exactly what it was, but it was like a, a crisp sort of edible. Um, and it was a different way to consume aside from gummies and stuff like that. And I'm not sure if we're quite there yet uh, in terms of the experimental types of edibles and things like that. But it would be interesting now to where you know, you can't necessarily have people selling product if they don't know what the product's about, you know, like you said, they're essentially just selling off the menu if they don't smoke it, right? So um, any vendors out there who are looking to speak with Gator, make sure that you, you know, at least smoke and can uh, clearly articulate the thing that you're trying to sell. <laughs> but before we continue, if you're enjoying this episode and are looking for some marketing help for your own dispensary, you can check us out at cannabudmarketing.com or visit us in the links in the description below. Now, on to the rest of the episode. Uh, you mentioned you're on store number four now, yes. right? Walk me through your experience from launching store number one, then two, then three, then four. What, what, what did that process look like for you guys? Sledgehammer to the face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Oh, God. So f number, store number f one, mm -hmm. when we first opened it, we, again, I wasn't even thinking about doing this business. So we jumped into it, had no clue what the fuck to do. Right. Um, we hired a couple people and right away before we even started, we had to fire people um, just because <laughs> I found out that they were on drugs and some other stuff and you're all, mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't do business with you. And then we started getting a following like literally the first month in 
And then within the first month, I was sleeping at the store and I left early in the morning, like four o'clock in the morning, and someone broke in and stole everything like 10 minutes after I left. All right. Um, be honest with you, I was a small business at the time, so I didn't have all the security measures I needed set up. Right. And, right. and so I was on the road pick, to go pick up, and my wife called me that everything was taken. Mm. And at that point, I mean, Dude, I had I was in, I had my parents' life savings. I mean, money in. I had all our money in. Dude, I it, it was almost like, do I give up? Like, what the mm -hmm, hell do mm -hmm. I do? I just let everybody down. Um, mm -hmm. had a little pity party for myself for about like five minutes and all right. picked up my bootstraps and I was all, fuck this. I'll do. I'll figure something out. And yeah. so I made a couple calls. And the funny thing is, a couple vendors I did call, they knew I was hurting. They actually mm -hmm. rose prices, which was crazy. Um. And I thought right then and there, I thought right away, I'll pay you guys back somehow. Right. And so I met a couple, couple people and they helped me out. They spotted me some stuff. And literally all I had was like 20 pounds of Blue Dream Shake. And <laughs> I had to flip it, bro. Right. And right. I flipped the fuck out of it. And then next thing I know, we're back up top again, like two months later. And we started growing right away. Right. My goal in the beginning was five stores in a year. Right. Um, I hit three. But the second store just literally happened out of a whim. We were just driving and we're all, yeah, we want to do a second store. She's all, yeah, why not? Maybe Let's, do a look. Let's call this guy. And so, sure. yeah. <laughs> and so we call a guy and he's all, that spot's going to be way too damn much, but I got another spot for you and it has a drive through And mm -hmm. I was like, cool. I was nice. like, fuck yeah. Tell me more. So we ended up with the building. This is the one on Picacho that started through a drive through It has our dispensary and it has a smoke lounge. Mm. And so we set all that up. We go through the city. We go through everything, get codes set up. And we're ready, almost ready to start. And me and my wife decided to drive to Cloudcroft for some reason. And we end up in looking for like just spots, just daydreaming. And then we end up in Rio Doso. And we drive mm. by this one spot. This is a house on the side of a fucking mountain. And I was all, let's call this guy. He's all, yeah, it's available. Just went on the market. I was all, take it. Crazy. And Crazy. so next thing I know, we went from two to three. And I didn't finish setting up my lounge in number two yet. And so we put all efforts into number three. Mm -hmm. And it was just trying to conquer and divide my wife's being in basically crucis i'm in rio doso the whole time we were we separated i mean not separated but we physically separated because we sorry live what are the uh the like the time distance between these locations you would say about two and a half two hours. months two oh, and yeah. two and a half yeah. two and a half hours okay two yeah. and a half hours distance wise yeah um right and we set up uh number two opened july 22nd number three opened august 30th so within a month, we set up two locations, two hours apart, just a husband and wife team and right. a handful of a handful of employees. And it's, you know, it's been uh, interesting doing this for the past. It's been about 10 months now that mm -hmm. we've had the three locations and now we're getting ready to open number four and we got plans for number five. That's that's insane. Gator, isn't this uh, much more exciting than just being a retiree and doing nothing all day? So I was literally having conversations with <laughs> someone about this yesterday. Yes, I was all, if don't. it was up to me, if it was up to me, I would mm -hmm. be a hermit on the side of the fucking mountain. I, I feel you. I, I, it's not that I don't like people. I don't like talking. Ever since mm -hmm. I was a kid, I was a shy, shy little child. Mm -hmm. I don't like interacting because back in the day, it was always negative. Now everything's mm -hmm. positive, so I don't right. mind doing it. Right, right. Um, but I'm not a social butterfly, but I'm great right. at what I do. I'm great mm -hmm. at making connections with my customers because I hate to say it. Most people are like me. They don't want to talk, but they talk. Yeah. And I love the stoner community. Um, everybody calls them patients. To me, they're not patients. Patience was an old term just to make it legal. Now, mm -hmm. yes, we do use it for uh, medical uses, but recreate, we all want to get high. Right. And ain't, ain't nobody going to lie. My, I mean, my grandma's alive. She should be like, yeah, it's for my ankles, but nah, dude, you, you you're still smoking, but there ain't nothing wrong with you. You, you have a big ass <laughs> smile. If you, right. you want to get high, 
we right. all just want to get high and just you know ease our ease our problems right but right. would i be doing this uh, uh i personally i want to be home do nothing um fishing yeah fishing. fishing somewhere but am i gonna do that no because i want to win right um, right like it, it, i'm fighting my i'm fighting my own self so i have like my ego and then what i really want to do <laughs> <laughs> well let's bring it back a little bit because i think i think i think ego is an interesting thing um I, I think it's a double-edged sword to where if you are so egotistical, then it's just, it's not advantageous to you whatsoever, but you do need ego to think that you are good enough to do something like start a business, right? Like you need to at least have some sort of confidence in yourself to be like, you know what? I can do this, right? Um, it's almost like the audacity to be like, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm the person to be able to, you know, kind of take over this industry and stuff right now. And I think, that plays very much into the story about, you know, store number one. And my question to you, and even to both of you really is like, why didn't you just kind of quit once, you know, that that all of that stuff happened? Why didn't you just be like, yeah, I'm I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go have a easy life after this. Like what what made you want to continue pushing forward? So my answer is I'm a fighter. Mm -hmm. My whole life, shit's happening to me, man. Right. Like I could have given up so many times when I was in Iraq, I could have given mm -hmm. up and died. Didn't mm -hmm. want to. I don't mm -hmm. want to give up. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to succeed and I want to see people happy. And when I joined this, it when I started this business, I've never seen so many people happy. Um, because I was being genuine while everybody else was trying to like rob them. And just me being fair made them love me and made me love them back. So if it was me by myself, I probably would, I probably would give up, but I had to carry so much other weight mm -hmm. and those people I love more than anything. So I won't give up my wife, my parents, my kids. I had so many people relying on me. And if I, if I gave up, what, what do I show my children? Right. Um, I don't want them to be all, Oh, if it gets hard, I quit. My dad did it. Right. No, I want them to see, Oh, my dad got got knocked down he got back up and knocked the fuck out because that's what we did we hit a grand slam as soon as we got back up right right now you what about yourself we're fighters scrappy yeah. fighters yeah yeah i mean we, we were talking about it before about you know doing difficult things as an entrepreneur doing even more difficult things as a cannabis entrepreneur and at the end of the day i, I think it's just the biggest self-development course that you can really take you know, you can talk to as many gurus out there as you want to. Um, but at the end of the day, if you do what's required for the business, you do what's required and you have to grow to that extent to be able to do those things. So again, um, fantastic job. The actual uh, getting robbed and stuff like that, obviously not good. But I think the person that you guys are able to be after a challenge like that is really impactful. And then it's also a story that now you can impart on others, especially your kids and be like, hey, look, this is the thing that I went through, you know your pants up a little bit and you know get to work because you know life isn't always going to be you know sunshine and rainbows it's going to be some some hard times as well absolutely and you know so many people throw around the the word sacrifice when it comes mm -hmm. to being an entrepreneur when it comes mm -hmm. to building a business or a brand or anything like that they say well you're gonna to have to sacrifice but until you've been through it you have no idea what level of sacrifice you are willing to endure just right. to make this dream work or to right provide for your family to to really give and that's the service the service mm -hmm. of this this organization the things that we do for our community that's what that's what keeps us going at the end of the day too right right awesome so we're gonna pivot a little bit um on kind of the marketing because again you guys have a super unique marketing strategy that i really enjoy and again you don't have to divulge any secrets or anything like that but like super high level kind of like what are the main things that are working for me from a marketing perspective so uh, on the marketing um one thing that i do is uh i pre-plan in the military if i wanted to if we wanted to go take out a town <laughs> Mm -hmm. We wouldn't just go attack that town. We would mm. plan that how to attack that town. So I have already planned at least six, seven months out. While mm -hmm. everybody's planning, planned for 420 two weeks ago, I had to plan five months ago. 
right um it's just being able to strategize properly and knowing what your what your customers are because every every everybody has a different selection of customers mm -hmm. so my customer base is is the middle class um and I hate to say it the lower class too so in that range right there i give price ranges that fit and suit them i try to give them the best price they can on the market versus everywhere else we're mm -hmm. technically cheaper than i would say the whole state by 40 percent to 60 percent wow um and it's not that we're getting different prices i'm just not being as greedy as the rest mm -hmm. i know what i could survive on i know what my bottom line is and i know what what make makes me move the ball further along mm -hmm. and so i don't rely on making the mass money off of one i do it right over a hundred customers right right and are you finding that model is like re replicable <laughs> can you replicate that model with all of these different stores because i know just based on kind of the other conversations that i've had with other dispensary owners is that like just because you're located in one location and you use this general strategy for location one that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to work for location two okay, and location three and so on. Are you finding that in general that works for you though? So um, 420 was the greatest example. Mm -hmm. um, if how can I reciprocate all the sales exactly the same? Right. Well, I had people spending the night outside my stores starting at eight o'clock and every single one. And we had about, about 50 people in each store mm -hmm. um, where they just spend the night and stay there. And so I've been able to do that every single cell I have. Mm. And so I've been able to just copy that model. And my model has been just knocking it out of the park. I mean, my customers just line up. We, mm -hmm. I get the bulk of my stuff first thing in the morning while well, before anybody even wakes up. Before I, 10 a.m., yeah. yeah. Before 10 a.m., we've already done, I don't know, $20,000 in sales. Wow. We open at 7 a.m. So in the first right. three hours of any of our major sales, like, all these posters behind us, each one's for a different sales. So we have like a Friday the 13th, the National Marshmallow Day, that sort of thing. And we just really hit the um, hit the grassroots marketing aspects of it. You know, right. go back to flyers. We have college campuses here uh, and within 40 miles. There's there's so many college students here. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many retirees. And uh, as far as the pricing goes with replicating that sort of thing. Like, yes, there are different demands at, at each location. Like our mm -hmm. original location, they are they sell a lot more flour than the other locations. Right. Second location sells more concentrates. The third location sells the most pre-rolls and edibles because mm -hmm. that's a tourist area. And so we have a, a high amount of, I'm not going to say Texans, but all the Texans come through and they want their vapes. They want their edibles. They want the stuff that doesn't smell. Right. And so, yes, the market is different at each location, but the pricing is the same mm. because that's the goal is to have average Joe pricing. We want everyday smoker to be able to come in and buy a, tw you know, $20 one gram cart, for, right. you know, for example. Right, right. And I think you guys are doing something excellent. Like it's one thing offering the prices that you're able to offer, but it's another thing about the consistency as well. Because it's like, if you only do one flyer for one kind of sale day, sure, that's fine. But now you're generating a lot of hype and awareness around each of your offers and each of the sales. Right now it's like, oh, I can't wait till Monster House has their next sale and, you know, does all these things because there is a level of consistency that you guys are able to offer better than anyone else that's saying like, I'm going to rest my, my sword on this one marketing uh, campaign, let's say it's a 420, right? And then not necessarily do anything after that, right? Um, because in general, you can offer sales for very much anything, right? You can do a Valentine's Day sale, right? Um, you can do a Super Bowl, you can do a Stanley Cup, you can do a NBA uh, sale, right? You can do pre-summer, you can do any sorts, sorts of sales, right? So uh, the consistency is something that I'm definitely applauding you guys at because it's not just one marketing campaign. It's like you're dedicating, what are the themes? What are the flyers? How do we get back to, the, like you say, the grassroots and actually put this out there so that people understand and know what you know, we have going on. So that's something that you guys are absolutely crushing for sure. So speaking of that, the greatest thing on 420 was um, after every big sell, what I do is I, that big sales already done the, mm -hmm. like two weeks prior to where even started. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about the next one. Mm -hmm. So when I had the, all my mass customers there, I was able to re-promote them 
for my next big sale, which is mm-hmm. May the 4th. Mm. Um, that is literally two weeks away from now. Crazy. And so I'm already hitting that. And as soon as May 4th, well, May 4th already done for me in my head. But yep. My next big one's coming. And so right. we're already planning on that. And right. so it's a constant game of uh, how do you stay the most popular? Right. And you have to keep their attraction and just yep. keep in customer attention. Right. Right. That's right. the main thing. How do you keep them coming back and st- staying loyal? Well, that's awesome. We're great at that. Awesome. Awesome. So where do you guys see the future of the cannabis industry heading? The industry itself? Yeah. Um, hopefully towards some federal tax regulations. <laughs> um, I don't know. So New Mexico, because I can only speak in New Mexico. I wasn't, of course. I wasn't here. I'm not that tenured into the cannabis industry mm-hmm. um so what i know in new mexico is the, the first year was everybody trying the second year is now everybody has to pay their taxes mm-hmm. and everybody is going under right now so the people mm-hmm. that weren't planning for the future are, are going under as we speak which is creating a more lucrative market right now right right and then on top of it too you have your msos you have your you have your um I was going to name drop. I don't need to name drop, but you have your multi-million dollar companies that own 48 locations across eight states and they're making $50 million a quarter. And those are the Walmarts of right. the industry. And yep. as far as, as far as we're concerned, we are going to do everything we can to stay away from that type of model. Right. You know, we do not want to be the, the, we don't want to be the Walmart. That's just, yeah, that's yeah. all there is to it. You know, we want to be the, more destination uh yep. attraction we want to be a little bit more niche we want to be a little more boutique and i think that anybody who really wants to begin in cannabis right now that's something that they should be looking at is what right. niche are they going to fill because the product doesn't just sell itself it does and it doesn't but there's no way you can just rest on your laurel saying i sell weed period 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah it's you're not, you're not going to compete with a McDonald's, right? Or, you know, a Wendy's that have, or Subway, right? Um, despite what people might say about the quality of their food going down and stuff like that, they just have so many stores and so much volume. It's absolutely crazy. And, you know, finding your niche, and that's something I also preach. It's just like, yes, you're selling what would normally be regarded as a commodity, but how do you wrap this commodity, right? How are you able to communicate with your audience? How do you curate your pricing? What is the theme of what you have going on? Like, you know, the wrapping really matters and two people can sell the same thing um, at drastically different prices and get drastically different customer bases, right? Um, And I think, again, um, I keep saying it, hopefully I'm not making your head, your guys' heads too big, but uh, just a a fantastic job through and through. Um, I'm just seeing, you know, I don't know, well, just kind of based on our, our conversations, it doesn't seem like you have any uh, uh, formal marketing, you know, kind of education or anything like that. Um, this is very much, you guys have been through the trenches, walk through the fire and come out the other side victorious. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can, or you guys can continue keeping that up, you know, in the next, you know, however long you guys want to do this for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like we call ourselves hustlers versus mm-hmm. everybody else is salesmen. So like right. the people that are formally educated, yeah, they're salesmen. Right. But I'm a hustler. I'll mm-hmm. figure out any way to get anybody into any product. And all our customer, all our staff are the same way. That's what mm-hmm. we look for is mm-hmm. people that know how to hustle on the streets. Yeah. Because street smarts is so hard to come by. And that's part of the niche too is, you know, so many people have been doing this on the streets for so long. And there's a certain amount of trust that comes in when you have your, your plug that you call all the time and your guy, I'll call my guy. I'm going to, I'm going to go pick up for my guy. Right. And so we want to be the guy to our people. And mm-hmm. that part of that comes with the attitude, the presentation, the, our appearance, our attitude. Um, you know, one of Gator's favorite things to say to customers when they walk in the store, it's their first time in, he says, all right, how fucked up do you want to get today? Which is like, <laughs> that's so street. You're not going to hear that in any mm-hmm. other dispensary. I think probably across the country, you probably have some trap dispensaries out in LA that are going to going to treat you that way. But <laughs> right. you're you know part and parcel. You're not going to find that anywhere else, especially here in Southern New Mexico. No, awesome, awesome. What advice would you guys give yourself if you were to start all over again? <laughs> Easy on yourself. Mm. Um. 
it's all going to work out. Like the stresses that we stress about, it's not the stresses we will continue to stress about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It gets easier and you'll figure a way out as long as you keep moving forward. Right. That that's the important piece. As long as you keep moving forward, things will work out. As soon as you stop trying to continually work on your stuff, um, then that's where you kind of throw in the towel and you really can't win after that, right? So, um, no, that's awesome. And um, I also have this little segment where um, I ask the previous owner uh, what question they have for the next owner that I'm interviewing. Um, so the question that they have right here is, and some context to this question, uh, this was regarding just the costs of, of uh, flour just kind of going up. I think these guys were located in, might have been Michigan. Um, so obviously it's a different state, but uh, their question was is, how much do you think is fair and reasonable for an ounce to cost regardless of THC level? Because there's some people really charging a lot of money for that. So in your opinion, what do you guys think? So one, one thing I do automatically, I don't shop by THC levels. So mm. I make sure I tell every vendor I'm buying by price, not by THC. Mm -hmm. So we're going to just stay with that. Um, on that, I think uh, outdoor weed should be about $75 an ounce. Right. Um, I think all like indoor weed should be about 150 mm -hmm. an mm -hmm. ounce. And I'm almost there for both. Uh, for right. outdoor weed, 100%, you get $75 ounces all, all day long. Mm -hmm. um, the harder part is indoor. Right, right, right. And I'll tell you, we'll go even one layer deeper. When our bread and butter, shake. Shake, people aren't capturing the market on shake. And right. we sell it for uh, two days a week. We run specials on it, and it's $45 mm -hmm. an ounce. Oh, wow. You, can't, you right. can't even get that in Colorado. Right, right. So there's a market for product that other people would deem, I guess, worthless trash, on, their, yeah. on their end. People call right. it trash. Right, right, right. And what question do you guys have for the next owner that I interview? What is the best return on investment marketing strategy that you have been able to implement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll make sure I get that answer. Um, I have my biased answer. We can chat about that later, but you know, that's, that's awesome. Um, and then... Last last couple things. Um, what's next in store for you guys um, over the next uh, couple weeks, couple months, couple years? Um, I know you have the the new store opening up, um, but anything else on the horizon? We're in the process of opening a coffee shop. Um, nice. I want to open a bar. Want to nice. open a restaurant. Um, so, but I do have the spot for the coffee shop right now. I just I got to get number four open right away. All right. And then I'm looking for a restaurant right now because. I know I can make some killer breakfast. I'm sure, I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> and where can people find you guys if they want to get in touch? Um, so we have monsterhousedispensary.com. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll give you all of our links as well. Our Insta is monsterhouse.lounge. Mm -hmm. And we actually also have an app. So, you know, they say if you don't like the way other people are doing it, you got to do it yourself. So we built an in-house app. Oh, where we nice. can post prices, we post memes, we have all of our menus available. Um, we send out push notifications for our um, flash sales, anything like that. So it's a Monster House dispensary on App Store and it's Monster House Dispo on Google Play. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Maggie Gator, uh, that was an insane story <laughs> on how you guys came to be. Um, even the speed at which you're able to open up stores is something to, you know, to, to be really, really in awe of because there's not many people who say, yeah, I started in 2022 when you have four stores already. Uh, we have a great customer base. Things are going well. The marketing is going well. Um, taking punches in the face uh, is, is part of the business, but getting back up is the other half that I don't think a lot of people have the, it's not even guts, but it's just like the mental fortitude to be able to continue pushing forward excuse me, pushing forward. Um, and I, I think that's also, I, I know you guys didn't mention it directly, but I, I think a lot of that is attributed to the fact that you two guys are incredibly close. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say the word power couple, but in a sense, I feel like 
uh, the support that you guys give each other, you know, the name Monster House as a whole is something that would really allow you to push through these walls. Um, so it's definitely something that I think a lot of people can learn of. And I just want to say thank you very much for, you know, hopping on this podcast, because I think this is going to be a killer one once it gets released. So thanks once again. Right thank on. you so much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Um, I was nervous as hell. So please <laughs> be nice and kind. <laughs> You didn't sound like it. That story was awesome. Thank you very much. Um, that's it for me today. Thanks for watching the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Kwan. Until next time, I will see you guys later. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. My name is Brandon Kwan, and I'm the founder of Cannabud Marketing, the number one marketing agency of choice for dispensaries, both in the United States and in Canada. If you ever want to get in touch with me about any marketing strategies, tips, and tricks, I can definitely help you. Just go visit our website at cannabudmarketing.com. Com. That's C-A-N-N-A-B-U-D marketing.com or just check the links in the description below. Until next time, talk to you later. Bye.